Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. All right, so I got more white wines going on here. Yeah, doing the white wines first. All right, so um, so again, from my friends over at Creative Palette, uh, we have a Pinot Grigio here. So Pinot Grigio, it gets a really bad rap um, with certain people in the wine industry, including me sometimes. Um, because I, I do have to say, there was a master psalm that I heard say once in a, in a like, you know in a, in a professional setting, not just like a little like one on one called Pinot Grigio the Coors Light of Wine because it tastes like nothing. The sad part is a lot of Pinot Grigio tastes like that, nothing. But I've also had some Pinot Grigios that were pretty spectacular. I'm hoping this is going to be spectacular. So um, especially because it's not cheap. It's Fairly expensive as Pinot Grigios go. So let's just get right into it. Oh, real quick. Uh, so I'm setting all this stuff up and I have like a white and a gray card um, to set white balance and exposure. I can't find them. I don't know where they're at. But funny enough, this gray is almost exactly the right color for, for exposure. And the, um, the MacBook Pro box is pure white. So it worked. Anyway, um, it was kind of cool to use it, but... I don't. I won't have, always have those things when I'm doing it. Well, at home I always will. Anyway, so let's get right into this. Uh, so this is the Peter Zimmer, uh, I believe it's the 16, 2016 Pinot Grigio Reserva Giatol. Um, G I A T L, not Giatol, not Giatol, Giatol, um, which is I think the town that that the Giatol is around the town. Anyway, um, so. This winery was founded in 1928 by Peter Zimmer. Um, he's the great uncle of the current wine current winemaker of the same name. Um, anyway, the vineyards and wineries in the best locations around Cortina, I don't know what SSDV is, uh, in the lowlands of Alto Adige, uh, have been part of the winery since then. Helmut Zimmer, uh, the founder's nephew, uh, has always been working in the business, and after an early death of his uncle in 1969, he took over the winery, uh, which he's turned into one of the leading companies in the region. Now his son, Peter, um, continues the legacy in the interest of his family. Uh, this sells for $38, by the way. So not cheap. So I'm expecting expecting quite a quite a... I mean, they talk really well about the wine when I when I read about it. Um, they talk about uh, sustainability for the winery, and um, uh, I'm trying to pull that up real quick. But I don't see anything about farming practices. So um, sustainability isn't always equate to organic or biodynamic. They might practice these types of things. It may not be certified because the reality is sometimes if you go for the certifications. Um, or sometimes when you try to practice organic or biodynamic farming and you have a really bad vintage, you know, bad weather and you, you've got to use conventional farming methods, um, then you lose your certification and it takes like years to get it back. So I don't know, they might be doing it and does it really matter? Not really, because there's lots of great wines that are farmed that have conventional farming. They, you don't necessarily need sustainability, I'm sorry, organic or biodynamic to have great wine. I just like it when they're able to do that type of stuff. Um, so to talk about the wine real quick, um, let's see here. Uh, so the location, uh, Guillotel, uh, stocked with vines grafted to slow growing rootstock and trained on wire trellises, Guillo. Um, so they're, if I remember correctly, it's just, they go up and then they just go out like that. Um, and then, uh, blah, 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 blah. So uh, the extraordinary, this extraordinary, extraordinary Pinot Grigio 
flourishes under outstanding climatic conditions on a stony, sandy, and extremely chalky soil in the valley floor around the center of Cord Cortina. The favorable location of the vineyard's ideal sunshine and the good ventilation of the berries assures the excellent quality of the grapes of this varietal. Uh, this is also a representative of the Burgundy family. I don't know why. It comes in a Burgundy bottle. They've mentioned Burgundy uh, a couple times. Uh, and the ventilation, so it's on a little bit of a hill. And it's on like the, the, the grapes for this wine are on the top of a hill. So it, it apparently takes advantage of a breeze that comes in, I guess, you know, helps keep things dry and probably helps reduce the disease pressure. Um, the grapes are pressed and the stems are removed in a pneumatic tank press. Before being pressed, a short cold maceration, that means uh, the skin, the skin contact, uh, takes place in order to enhance the fruitiness of the wine. Um, Afterwards, the grapes are gently pressed and clarified through the natural settling of sediments. Uh, fermentation takes place in small casks of French oak in which this particular wine acquires complexity through its 12-month aging and ripening on the yeast. After bottling, several further months of aging take, takes place for completion before this unique white wine, yada, yada, yada. All right, so one also thing is this winery is one of the only wineries, I think is the only winery, that has... Um, the reserva status and in this part of Italy it requires 24 months of total aging uh, between barrel and, and bottling, bottle age and barrel age. So um, we're talking serious winemaking here, not just like, hey man, let's like pick some Pinot Grigio and like, you know, ferment it and like six months later put it in a bottle, you know, just do stainless tank. Uh, let's see here, uh, sustainability. Uh, the entire demand for energy of the winery is covered by renewable energy. Electricity is produced by solar energy um, with solar panels on the roofs, roofs, roofs of the winery. Um, and then they say, so they don't only set the standard for sustainability with responsible natural winemaking. They say natural winemaking. So th that's this like the only part they talk about winemaking being natural. Uh, but also with unique sustainable approach to energy, yada, yada, yada. Uh, which that enables the production of power with zero emission in a silent and efficient way. So let's talk about natural winemaking real quick. Uh, there's no legal definition of that. My feeling is that is as non-interventionist as possible. Um, so there's probably, it's probably native fermentation, so native yeast, um, and they probably use the least amount of sulfur possible. Um, they may not even sulfur at the very end. Sulfur is a natural, um, natural way of preserving wine. It doesn't hurt the wine. Yeah, you can over sulfur things. If you put too much sulfur in there, you could get some, some, some sulfide um, aromas, but no one really over sulfurs like that. Um, if, the, if you do, it's a fault and you can get that. Um, and, uh, but it can also uh, cause uh, reduction which gets you that H2S, that, 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 you know, the rotten egg thing. So the sulfur like soaks up the oxygen and um, it's a natural preservative. It helps protect the wine against oxygen. But if you put a lot of sulfur in there, it gets super reductive and then it can interact with the other chemicals and you can get that hydrogen sulfide type of thing going on. Um, but again, that's usually a fault. Uh, so if you over, over sulfur, it's not harmful necessarily. Um, sulfites, I, I've talked about this before, sulfites in the wine, there's way more sulfites in dried fruit and like preserved meats and things like that than you get in the entire bottle of wine. So um, you're not getting, I mean, some people might be sensitive to sulfites, um, which is, you know, an I, some, some, a different ionic, different ion of sulfur. Um, and how it, I'm, I'm going to get into the chemistry of it, but it's, it's not sulfide and sulfite are different things. There's sulfur, but it's like an ion of sulfur. I won't go into, I can't remember which one's which, but sulfites in general are not going to hurt you at the levels that there are in wine, unless you're like overly sensitive to it, then it could not hurt, but like you could be affected. I right, just get into the wine. All right, so I mean, really deep color, first of all. So that maceration helps with the color. Super like yellow gold uh, on the color. I mean, if I was looking at this wine, I'd almost think it's Chardonnay just on the, on the, on the visual on it. So kind of like the, the white wines I've already done tonight, not a whole lot on the nose. 
I mean, it smells like white wine, a touch of orange, orange blossom, but this is like really, like I'm pulling that out. Like I got it, not that I have to say something, but I kind of feel like it, it's it's there. I got to kind of like reach in and like drag it out, like what's in there. So it, it feels like it's orange and orange blossom. That's really about it. So let's taste it. There's a grippiness to it. That maceration is helping with that. Um, there's definitely a, a bitterness to it that's coming from the grape skins. Um, super high on the acid. I don't want to say super high, but definitely high on the acid. Mouth watering a lot. Um, there's like this bitter orange, um, almost like an orange bitters, I guess. Or, it's like a bitter orange, orange peel um, uh, type of thing. So it's heavy on the orange. Um, peach. Uh, the peach skin. So this, it's really text. It's a lot, a lot of textural things going on here. Um, it tastes good. It tastes it doesn't really taste complex, but complex for a Pinot Grigio. Like usually Pinot Grigio is like, ah, it's just really refreshing and light. It's kind of just you know that's it. This one has some like oomph to it. Um, A bit of yellow golden apple to it also um and a touch of waxiness to it um the bitterness is really what's driving this wine for me um uh, and the acid um it's not a pinot grigio that i'm used to drinking uh, i have a pinot grigio here also that i bought uh at a local wine shop that's it's uh it, it looks what i've been told it kind of looks almost pink almost like a rosé Again, extended maceration on that. I'm interested to see how that how that tastes, um, and how it looks. This is, I think, somewhat similar in that sense. It doesn't have the pink hue um, that extended maceration would have. Um, it's not going to say extended maceration on this, but it definitely has a some maceration to get that color um, and get that grippiness. Do I like the wine? It's okay. I mean. It's gonna be a wine that I'm probably have to grow into. Like I'm probably have to drink the entire bottle and be kind of at the end, at the end go, wow, this is actually pretty darn good. Um, it's just a style of Pinot Grigio I'm not used to. It's really just kind of style of white wine I'm not used to drinking. And I think it has a lot to do with the, the process of this wine. This wine is more process driven than necessarily grape driven. Um, it's got the characteristics of Pinot Grigio. Um, it's got peach, it's got some orange. Um, it's not, very aromatic for me, um, but it's got the phenolic bitterness that you will get from Pinot Grigio because it, it, it tends to have that in the wine. Um, it's 38 bucks. It's not cheap. Um, it's up there. I mean, it's probably one of the most expensive Pinot Grigios, at least on the retail side, I've seen. Uh, not that I've seen a lot of Pinot Grigios, but one of my favorite Pinot Grigios costs about 25 ish dollars. Um, so it's not exactly, you know, a Pinot Grigio that's like your typical everyday drinking one, like, you know, a $10 or a $15 one. And this is this is definitely in that category. This is, you know, you're going to you're going to have something maybe comp, something a little more complexity with food. Um, I mean, I could see totally this with some some like, I don't know, like a like a, a Parmesan chicken with a with like a with a, a, a white sauce, not like a red sauce. You could even do just Parmesan chicken with the traditional red sauce, but I see this with more like cream white sauces, um, breaded, you know, something that's breaded, um, pork, not necessarily breaded pork, but like pork, chicken, um, could be grilled. I mean, this is a wine that, was, that can stand up to some food here. It's It's got some body to it and all that. That's why I think if I probably paired it with food or I like just kind of was in a situation where I'm not like having to like spew something stream of consciousness, I would be kind of sit back and go, wow, this is really good. I see potential in this wine. I see potential in me liking this wine more than I like it right now. Um, part of it's mood because I'm in a kind of an antiseptic, like analytical thing on the wine um, versus like just relaxing, which happens quite a bit when I review wines. If I don't give it like a glowing review, um, and then I 
sit down, I'm just kind of relaxing. I'm just just drinking the wine, not even like trying to overthink it. I go, wow, this wine was way better than I tasted before. Um, but I've also had wines that I analyze. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome wine. I taste it a little bit later. I'm like, it really wasn't not as good as I thought it was. But it's usually the first one. Usually it's like the wine tastes way better the second time around than it did the first time. It's not normally tastes worse the second time around. Hey, it's still going. You know what it is? It reminds me, and this might be where this burgundy thing keeps coming from. It kind of reminds me of a white burgundy. And I think that's what it is. It's like confusing me. Like this is Pinot Grigio. It kind of like tastes like a white burgundy with with some with some phenolic bitterness to it. So like if I was given this like in a blind, I would be kind of confused if this is burgundy or Pinot Grigio, but I probably would lean towards the burgundy because there's a richness to it. It's growing on me. I'm kind of liking it a little more. It's warmed up a little bit more. Um, I'm kind of wrapping my head around what it is instead of like trying to pigeonhole it into like really generic crappy Pinot Grigio, which it's not. So. Again, it's 38 bucks, and I have a feeling that uh, when I crack this open, like for real, um, down the road, that I'm going to be like, wow, this, this wine is way better than I initially thought it was. So if you see it, I'd say buy it. Like, if you want to, like, have some legit Pinot Grigio that's, that's out there, you know, buy it. Um, but just realize it's not going to be Santa Margarita, okay? It's not going to be, like, really watery, really light thin Pinot Grigio that's super refreshing for like a hot summer day, you know, but this is not that. This is serious Pinot Grigio. I'm just going to swallow that. Yeah, it's getting better and better now that I'm kind of getting used to it. All right, so um, that's going to do it for this episode. Click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below below to uh, find more information about these guys. Uh, there's a donate button over there. So hit that and um, there it is right now. And then we'll see everyone again next time.